Robert, it's a pleasure to welcome to the program Huffington Post writer and author of Rise of the Warrior Cop, Radley Balco. Radley, welcome to the program. Uh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. So, all right, Radley, let's start. Give us a little bit of a, a historical context. When did the, uh, the cops start to rise to becoming a, a warrior? Well, uh, I think it goes back uh, to the late 60s, actually. Um, we started to experience some civil unrest uh, in the U U.S., uh, and really the, the precipitating incident was probably the Watts riots in 1965 in L.A., uh, the head of the, uh, or the ins uh, inspector at the uh, LAPD at the time, who later became police chief, Daryl Gates, uh, was in charge of LAPD's reaction to the riots. And he was alarmed that uh, he felt the department didn't really have an adequate way of responding uh, to these kinds of, you know, emergency situations where you had lives at immediate risk uh, and, you know, active shooters or riots, um, hostage takings, you know, emergency type situations. Uh, so he came up with this idea uh, to turn to the military, uh, and the military had these, you know, special forces type teams that uh, could respond quickly, uh, who were, you know, elite, highly trained, specialized, uh, and could use, you know, you would use overwhelming force to quickly uh, diffuse a violent situation. Uh, so he put together this this team, and he, he called it a, uh, a SWAT team, and he. Uh, initially, the response from LAPD was interesting. They actually uh, did not, Chief William Parker did not like the idea. He said it tread too close to uh, breaching the line between uh, domestic police and the military that we've traditionally respected in the U.S. Uh, and it wasn't really until a new chief took over that Gates got the green light to go ahead with this idea. Uh, there were a couple of high-profile raids, one on the Black Panthers, one on the Symbionese Liberation Army that were nationally televised. Uh, and that really kind of propelled this idea of the SWAT team into the popular culture. Uh, and by the mid-1970s, pretty much every large city in the country uh, had one. We, the thing about the, the 70s, though, and the, the early, you know, the first decade or so of SWAT is that they were, they were always reserved for these kinds of emergency situations where you're, you're using violence uh, to diffuse an already violent situation and you're, you're saving lives that are at immediate risk. Uh, it's really in the 1980s that we start to see SWAT teams uh, converge with the drug war, and we start to see a massive, massive increase in the use of SWAT, uh, mostly to serve warrants on people suspected of drug crimes. And, you know, here you're using violence, or you're actually creating violence, but there was none before. You're not using violence to, you know, de-escalate something, you know, an already violent uh, situation. Uh, and you're using SWAT actually as an investigative tool. Um, you know, before SWAT teams were used against people who you know, were in the process of committing crimes, so there's no question about their guilt. Uh, but in the 80s, 90s, and you know, up until today, SWAT is overwhelmingly used against people who you know, not only uh, haven't been convicted of any crime, uh, but have, haven't even been charged, and the police are still in the evidence-gathering stage of their investigation. Uh, and that's really where... You know, the, I think most of uh, my criticism in the book comes, uh, it's not an anti-SWAT book or an anti-cop book even. It's, it looks at the policies that really uh, were behind this shift from using SWAT in emergency situations to using them more proactively and, and, and as an investigative tool. And, and it seems to me, too, that the, the sort of the... The culture around SWAT, if 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 you, if you can call it that, has sort of bled into the the police department. I mean, I remember in the early '80s, uh, in 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 my hometown, Massachusetts, having some SWAT guy come to our classroom or something, and the uh, the the idea of SWAT was just very, it seemed compartmentalized. That it was a very specific group of police. Uh, who were on the force, who had access to the gear and had access to the training. And it seems on some level that that, 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 that sort of compart... The, 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 I don't want to call it a firewall, but it whatever it was, it seems like that wall has sort of maybe in some respects just disappeared totally. Yeah, and I think that's the larger story here, is that this culture of, of militarization has bled out beyond the SWAT teams, uh, and it's really affected 
uh, a lot of police departments across the country uh, more in a more widespread way. And I mean, you know, it isn't just the paramilitary tactics, but it's also a mindset. Um, you know, along with the explosion of, of of the number and use of SWAT teams, we've seen um, you know politicians that constantly told police officers that they're fighting wars, that they're fighting wars on drugs, on crime, you know, on terrorism. Uh, and, you know, police, a lot of police departments have switched from the traditional police blues to what they call BDUs or uh, battle dress uniforms. Uh, there's, you know, they've, they've adopted a more military look. Uh, and you, see, you can see this in, you know, the, the, the way that police officers approach their jobs. Uh, if you take a cop and you put him in, you know, a soldier's clothing and give him a soldier's weapons and train him in a soldier's tactics and then send him out on the streets and tell him he's fighting a war, that's going to have, uh, you know, an impact on the way he approaches his jobs and the way he approaches his job and the way he interacts with the community that he serves. Tell, tell us a little bit about what that impact is when the the rubber meets the road, because I, I, I think that I think that dynamic of, you know, you start dressing someone like a uh, a member of a paramilitary organization, they're going to start to feel like they're a member of a paramilitary organization. I mean, what are the implications of that in terms of policing? Yeah, well, I mean, in addition to just the, you know, the, the explosion, the number of SWAT teams, but I, I think, you know, you see it in a lot of, um, if you go to police discussion boards online, you know, you'll see a lot of um, uh, iterations of a phrase, uh, basically to the effect of, I'll do whatever I have to do to get home safely at night. Uh, and, you know, that's, that is a, that's a battlefield mentality, right? I'm going to do whatever I have to do to get home safe. Uh, that is not, you know, that's a far cry from protect and serve, protect and serve or uh, keep the peace. Um, there is a, you know, police officers are, are told every day that their job is, uh, you know, extremely dangerous and, and getting more dangerous. And, in fact, uh, you know, it, it's certainly a more dangerous job than mine as the journalist, but, the job is not, I mean, it's not, it's usually not in the top 15 or 20 most dangerous jobs in the country. Uh, and in fact, if you take out car accidents, um, the odds of a police officer being killed, murdered on the job are about the same as uh, being murdered simply by living in most large cities in the U.S. Uh, so, you know, this isn't to, to you know, uh, uh, diminish the, the fact that some police officers are actually killed on the job. But the problem with this is that you know, the job has actually also been getting safer, I should add. Uh, last year was the safest year for police officers uh, since the early 1960s. Uh, and so the problem with this is that you tell police officers every day that uh, you know, their, their job is extremely dangerous and every interaction with a citizen could be their last, uh, you encourage them to start seeing citizens as threats and every citizen as a potential threat and the person who you know, may be the, the one who prevents them from going home that night. Uh, and that really fosters a... Uh, uh, you know, an antagonistic relationship, uh, again, between cops and, and the community. Um, you know, you see this with uh, the stop snitching movement that's uh, kind of bubbled up in a number of cities. And, you know, whatever you think of that movement, and I understand people who, who find it, you know, repugnant, the idea that people won't cooperate with police even in a murder investigation, for example. Um, you just understand the sentiment behind it, and, and it's pretty remarkable that there are entire, you know, communities in this country where, uh, the residents of those communities uh, fear the police more than they fear the people the police are supposed to be protecting them from, uh, and I think we need to look at you know why that is. And you can you know you can blame it on hip hop culture if you want, but uh, you know I think there is uh, something more kind of fundamental at stake, and that, and I think it goes back to again this shift uh, in policing that we've seen over the last generation or so. So was it? I mean, uh, I, I know that you really uh, focus on uh, on the drug war uh, as being sort of the, the the catalyst, or I should say, the maybe the fuel that um, uh, that was added to this sort of uh, fire that had, had had begun in terms of of creating SWAT teams. Uh, just outline for us sort of how that uh, how the drug war evolved and what uh, what, what laws that came in that sort of followed, I guess, on a parallel track or maybe um, uh, one that sort of drove uh, this the, this change in police culture? Yes, yeah, so you know, the drug war began in the Nixon administration and when he declared war on drugs. Uh, but, you know, the, the, SWAT, the SWAT phenomenon was basically sort of being born at the same time. Uh, but as you said, the two, the two trends sort of moved parallel to one another throughout the 1970s. Uh, Nixon, you know, did pass policies like the no-knock raid, um, but 
it was applied to uh, basically federal narcotics cops, basically cops who are, you know, uh, in street clothes or in, you know, some sort of uh, uniform. And these weren't SWAT teams that were conducting these raids early on. It was really during the Reagan administration that we see uh, the use of SWAT teams for drug raids take off. And uh, there are a couple of reasons for that. One is, uh, you know, Reagan really kind of blurred the line between police and military. He you know, brought in the National Guard to start fighting the drug war. Uh, at one point, he even tried to bring active duty troops in to start conducting searches and making arrests. Um, that was one of the few bad ideas, actually, that didn't get didn't become policy uh, during the 1980s. But, you know, he created these joint, toy, joint uh, task forces that, uh, encourage cooperation between the military and police and domestic police uh, for drug interdiction efforts. Uh, and then he started to make uh, military equipment available to police departments across the country. And this, you know, this is a policy that's continued ever since. And what we've seen is literally millions of pieces of, of equipment that was designed for use on a battlefield uh, has been given to domestic police for use on American streets and American neighborhoods and against American citizens. You know, we're talking tanks and armor personnel carriers and helicopters and guns and bayonets. Uh, and, you know, this is, uh, this has been going on for, you know, 35 years now. There's never really been any, you know, public debate or public discussion about whether it's appropriate. Uh, the other thing that, that uh, Reagan began that has continued ever since is he created these anti, federal anti-drug grants. And, you know, we have a history in this country of uh, determining criminal justice and law enforcement policy, leaving it to, to local officials. Side. So they, you know, they decide what laws are going to be a priority, and uh, they you know, enforce laws in a way that reflect community standards and community values and community expectations. And uh, it really began with Nixon, but what we saw during Reagan, and again, has continued ever since, is uh, more heavily federal influence uh, in, uh, in local policing. And basically the way they've done this is through these grants. Um, and you know, when the federal government starts making you know, free money available to police departments, uh, the catches you know, uh, uh, rules or, or uh, requirements that, you know, in order to get this money, you have to do more drug policing or, or these, gr- these grants are only going to go uh, toward drug policing. So you have to make so many drug arrests or confiscate so much, uh, like a minimum quantity of illicit drugs in order to get these grants. So now, you know, drug policing becomes a much higher priority. And so you've got all this gear that you got for free. Uh, so you start a SWAT team. Now, you can keep the SWAT team in reserve for, and wait for one of these emergency-type situations uh, you know, that, that SWAT teams are created for, uh, or you can start sending your SWAT team out on drug raids now, uh, and there's all this money that comes with that, and, and now your SWAT team can actually start generating revenue for the police department. Uh, so it wasn't a difficult decision uh, for a lot of police agencies, uh, and then this is really how we see SWAT teams uh, start to be routinely used uh, to serve drug warrants or search warrants in drug cases. Talk, talk about how um, these uh, these drug cases can actually generate revenue for a police department. Well, you've got, I mean, you've got the federal grants that I, that I mentioned that, that only go to drug policing. So if you, you, know, if you send your SWAT team out to arrest a, murder, a suspected murderer, uh, there's no federal money that comes with that. If you send them out to, to, to uh, raid, you know, a couple of people suspected of dealing or, um, you know, smoking pot uh, and make the arrest, uh, there's federal money that, that is attached to that. Uh, but then there's also asset forfeiture, uh, which is this policy civil asset forfeiture, which says that, you know, if you raid a place and you can make even a loose connection between any cash or, you know, a car or a house and any kind of drug activity, the police can then seize that property. Uh, and it's up to the property's owner now to prove uh, that they earn the property legitimately. And we basically have to prove a negative. Uh, and, you know, you, the, the, the property owner actually never even needs to be charged with a crime. And if the police are able to, if the, if the owner can't prove that he earned it legitimately, and, and if you think about all the things you own and, and you're asked to prove that you bought them or owned them legitimately, how difficult that would be, uh, the police department gets to keep it, and the revenue goes back to the department. Uh, and this is almost always tied to drug cases. There are some other crimes that forfeiture comes with, but it's mostly drug cases. So again, there's another incentive, you know, to send your SWAT team out uh, on these drug raids. And, and how much also um, did the uh, did sort of the the uh, war on terror add to this? Because it seems to me that there was just a tremendous amount of money that was earmarked uh, for uh, for homeland security, as it were. Which um, again, it's one of those situations where. 
and what's interesting is that, I mean, is this money uh, necessarily earmarked to um, uh, to buy equipment, or is it is it up to the discretion of police departments as to whether or not they can simply add a couple of of police officers? I mean, I know that, uh, and you give Clinton some praise in the book for uh, the community pre- uh, policing uh, programs, and 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 rightfully criticism for for other uh, aspects that. Um, uh, he he expanded under 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 his presidency, mm-hmm. but how much discretion, particularly when it comes to all this uh, terrorism funds, is there for the police departments to say hire another cop as opposed to getting a an armored personnel uh, carrier? Well, we're talking about a couple different programs here, uh, and the community policing program that was started during the Clinton administration. Um, you know, I praise the intent of the program in the book, but actually, its effect was was fairly pernicious, uh, and you touched on the problem, which is that there's no oversight with these grants. Uh, how they get spent once the check leaves uh, the federal government uh, is up to the individual police department. And so, you know, c- community policing is this idea that cops should have a stake in their communities and you know, they should walk beats and, uh, and you know, uh, be a part of the communities that they serve instead of this, you know, kind of occupying force, basically. Uh, and it's a good, I mean, it's, it's a, a more effective, uh, better approach to policing. The problem is, again, uh, there was no oversight. And so uh, a couple of investigations actually found that some police agencies were taking this money for community policing and using it to start SWAT teams, uh, which is sort of the very opposite of community policing. Uh, and in fact, uh, a criminologist, uh, Peter Kraska, the criminologist at uh, Eastern Kentucky University, did some surveys of police departments and actually found a lot of police uh sheriffs and police chiefs actually considered SWAT teams and more active SWAT teams a part of a community policing strategy, uh, which was not at all the intent of the grants or, you know, of the Clinton administration when they started it. So, you know, the problem is with the oversight. Uh, you talk about the anti-terror grants, and this is what we see after September 11th. We see the Department of, Department of Homeland Security start uh, sending these checks out to police departments across the country uh, to buy military gear. And again, you know, some of these, some the grants are, uh, some of them are earmarked specifically uh, for, you know, to hire more cops or to do to sort of port security. Uh, but what we are seeing is a lot of these grants are going specifically to buy military-type gear, uh, armor personnel carriers, for example, or, you know, um, uh, more powerful uh, weapons, uh, guns and weapons for police agencies. And, you know, the problem with this is that if you go back to the Pentagon program, the Pentagon giveaways, you know, that was all equipment that already existed. You know, it was sitting in a warehouse somewhere. Um, these DHS grants are going to buy new equipment, which means uh, they've given rise to a cottage industry now that has sprung up uh, to serve basically just to cash these DHS grants uh, and produce this new battle-grade equipment. Uh, and so you've got this industry now that is wholly reliant uh, on these grants. And, you know, ine- inevitably... Uh, they're going to open a lobbying office in D.C. and uh, lobby to make sure that these programs continue and expand. Uh, and, you know, it's all going to sort of start to feed off of itself. Uh, and now you've created what you might call a police industrial complex, a uh, little little brother of the military industrial complex. Uh, and, the th- and, you know, the, the scary thing about that is, you know, once that's all in place and, and up and rolling, it's going to be really difficult to uh, to roll any of this back. And so, um, I mean, I, I don't want to uh, jump too ahead because I want to talk about w- what the implications are for this. I mean, I, I mean, it, you know, and I don't, I don't want to say that. Um, uh, well, I mean, the question here is: is then could this this move? And and what is problematic about the the sort of the police setting themselves up in a a, a much more adversarial role? Uh, to the community than they should. And I think we can see that. I mean, it, it seems to me that we can see that manifested in a couple of areas. I mean, uh, you know, even a, a program like Stop and Frisk, at least how it's been uh, implemented in New York, would you see that as something that has emanated out of the, the, the culture that has grown up around, uh, uh, that it's an offshoot of this culture that has grown up around policing? Well, sure, yeah. And, you know, I mean, part of the problem there, too, is that you have these police officers who are from outside the community coming into these communities, usually you know, communities of color, 
uh, and you know, basically harassing people. I mean, there was just an article today about a guy who had been stopped and stopped and frisked over 50 times, uh, and you know, had never actually been charged with a crime. Apparently, he just looks suspicious. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I think that is part of it. Although, you know, stop and frisk is also a, at, at heart, it's a gun control program. Uh, so it, uh, it, it plays, I think, to, uh, some progressive, uh, misguided progressive ideas on, on law and order as well as conservative ideas on law and order. Uh, but I, I yeah, I, you know, I definitely think that, uh, that that's part of it. And it's, you know, it, it creates a very antagonistic relationship between police, uh, and citizens. And I mean, you know, at the very heart of stop and frisk is this idea that, you know, everybody is a potential threat. Anybody could be carrying a gun. Therefore, the police should be stopping and searching anyone who looks the least bit uh, suspicious. And, uh, you know, New Yorker or, you know, Bloomberg and Kelly would argue that it's made New York safe. Uh, I don't know. You know, crime has dropped across the country over the same period, including in cities that uh, didn't use stop and frisk. So uh, the idea that that's behind a New York crime drop, I think, you know, uh, flies in the face of a lot of other uh, other evidence. Uh, how much do you see? I mean, we we also have. I mean, particularly in, in New York, but uh, but I imagine it as well across the country, a convergence of um, of sort of the 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 national security state in terms of spying, uh, particularly out of the New York uh, Police Department, working hand in hand with. Uh, I, I don't even know if I could call this guy a CIA liaison. He was sort of uh, pulling two. <laughs> Two paychecks uh, simultaneously, but we know the stories of the New York Police Department spying on uh, Muslim students throughout the Northeast and um, and, and beyond. Um, where do you fit that into uh, your, your your thesis here? Well, I mean, you know, the government does have a uh, national security is a legitimate function of the government, uh, but I do think we. We need to be very careful of what's going on here. I mean, you know, it's telling that right, at, if you remember, right after the September 11th attacks, uh, the following February during the Super Bowl, uh, the White House, uh, the Office of National Drug Control Policy, aired these commercials that basically, that basically attempted to tie casual drug use, uh, hot use, uh, to terrorism. Uh, and this was a very, uh, you know, uh, I mean, I mean the, it was completely intentional. Uh, and, you know, if you can... The government, right off the bat, was trying to tie the drug war to the war on terror, of course, because terrorism was the thing that people were most afraid of at the time. Uh, and so we've seen this kind of conflation of these two issues, uh, you know, ever since. The, uh, the BBC and the Washington Post have both done long series on, I think Time has too, on you know, how our, our, our anti-drug interdiction efforts in Afghanistan are you know, uh, harming the war on terror because we're, you know, we're sending soldiers out there to burn uh, opium fields while, you know, farmers watch as, you know, U.S. troops set their uh, livelihood aflame. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, hurting our relations over there and it's hurting our ability to actually find terrorists. Uh, and you see this, you know, all across public policy. Um, the, uh, the, well, I, just with this NSA stuff, I mean, just a couple of weeks ago, we found that we learned that the DEA, uh, was trying to get its hands on all this NSA data in order to launch drug investigations. So we got to be very careful about this because I mean, even if you and I, I have lots of problems with the, the the NYP spying programs and the CIA infiltration, all of that. But um, you know, even if you do support that as a, a legitimate function of government, uh, it very very quickly become bleeds over into more routine sorts of law enforcement. Uh, so you know, I think I think we should be wary of uh, what's going on for its own sake, but also we should you know understand that. Uh, once government gets these sorts of powers, even if it's in the context of you know limiting it to national security, uh, it isn't long before it finds other excuses to use it as well. And and one of those examples I think of that uh, that bleed too is uh, the the response to the Occupy movements, at least in in, in New York and in certainly other cities across the country. You've got um, a, a just sort of the. The, I mean, I think people can remember the sight of sort of these robocop uh, cops, uh, you know, storming a, a public park, uh, as it were. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I imagine that's also uh, part of what is problematic is that, again, there, this is bleed over, right? I mean, it's a mission creep in some respects. Yeah, and, and this is another a separate narrative that uh, goes through the book is the, the way government responds to protests 
uh, and it goes back to the occupied, I'm sorry, the occupied, the WTO protest in Seattle in 1999 and the way the city responded to those protests, uh, which was, you know, the city basically came out expecting confrontation. You know, the cops came out in their, uh, Robocop or Darth Vader gear, however you want to call it, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and, you know, I interviewed the, the chief of, of police of Seattle at the time, Norm Stamper, in the book. Uh, and, you know, he thought, you know, it was better to be overprepared and prepare for confrontation than to regret not being prepared. Uh, and to some extent he was right, but, you know, uh, there's a better way to handle that. And, and I also interviewed uh, Jerry Wilson, who was a police chief in D.C. in the early 70s, you know, during a period of a lot of civil unrest in this country, particularly in D.C., and he took a very different approach. Uh, Wilson said, you know, he would always put his uh, uniform cops on the front line, the guys in their traditional police blues. In fact, he would sometimes go out on the front line. Uh, and, you know, he said you'd have your riot squad ready and you have to be prepared, but he said he would put them on buses and park them off on side streets uh, because his approach was, or his philosophy was, again, if you go into a protest expecting confrontation, then, then that's what you're going to get. Uh, and when the police show up, you know, dressed like that, uh, both they and the protesters are starting from a point of, you know, something bad is about to happen. Uh, and, you know, Stamper, uh, to his credit today, he says his response to those protests in Seattle were the biggest mistakes of his career. Because uh, he said he, he, he's seen how that has become the template, that that's how every city now responds to protests. Uh, and he said it, he actually said it breaks his heart, uh, that he was, you know, he sees himself as responsible for that. Uh, and, you know, I mean, the, 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 the inherent irony here is that, um, you know, the, the more important the event, uh, you know, the more influential the uh, decision makers, the more consequential the decisions they're going to be making, uh, the more likely it is that the protesters are going to be put as far away from the event as possible. Uh, and that's, you know, that's the pretty much the opposite of what the First Amendment is supposed to be all about. You know, it's supposed to be about... Uh, being able to be heard and being able to uh, have your complaints, uh, you know, heard by the people who are making the decisions. And we seem to have, you know, this way we respond to protest is, seems to be in direct uh, contravention of, you know, everything the First Amendment is supposed to be about. Wilson's an interesting uh, character because he also um, he also resisted the the, the no knock um, um, raids as well, right? I mean, right. he he. Yep. No. he go ahead. Yeah, this is, well, this is a policy that Nixon, this is one of Nixon's sort of uh, pet policies that he pushed through uh, in 1970. And, you know, the interesting, the interesting thing about the no-knock raid is that it wasn't something that police chiefs were clamoring for. It wasn't something that criminologists were saying we should have. Uh, it was basically the idea of a 28-year-old Senate staffer uh, who was looking for issues that Nixon could use in the 68 campaign to basically exploit suburban uh, white fears about black urban crime. Uh, and so they came up with this idea of, well, you know, we should, cops should, should be able to, you know, break down people's doors without knocking. And, you know, if they're suspected of drug crimes, then we need to get tough on them. And, uh, and so Nixon pushed this through. And there were two bills. One applied to federal narcotics officers across the country. The other applied uh, just to D.C. because Congress has jurisdiction over um, Washington, D.C. So just the drug police in D.C., and Wilson uh, didn't want it. He said, you know, we don't need this. We, uh, it's intrusive. It's, it violates, you know, civil rights, uh, civil liberties, and it's just not necessary. He said, you know, we can, we can do drug policing without uh, kicking down people's doors in the middle of the night. Uh, an interesting thing is that, uh, you know, a lot of other states passed no-knock bills similar to the Nixon bill, and, of course, the federal agents were using it left and right across the country. Uh, and D.C. refused, and, and crime actually went down in D.C. Uh, while Nixon was president, uh, while it went up in the rest of the country. Uh, now, you know, I don't, I don't think uh, Jerry Wilson's refusal to use no-knock raids is the reason why crime went down in D.C., uh, but I, I think it, the, more broadly, his approach to policing, which is a more community-oriented approach where you know, he um, had cops out walking beats, he, he strove to recruit uh, police officers from within the city so that, you know, there were people who were a part of the communities they were policing and grew up in those communities. Uh, and it really seemed to, you know, to have an effect. Um, the other interesting thing about the no-knock bills is that the federal bill passed. And as I said, you know, federal narcotics officers were kicking down doors left and right after this bill passed. Uh, but there were a few cases where they got the wrong house uh, that became national news. And the New York Times did an investigation, the AP did an investigation, 
And they found actually dozens and dozens of these of instances where these federal narcs had, you know, kicked down the wrong door, raided houses without a warrant, you know, terrorized people. There were a, a, a few deaths. Uh, and uh, really a fascinating thing happened, which is a Congress held hearing, and they brought in the victims of these raids to testify, and they actually repealed both laws. Uh, not only that, they passed another law that made the federal government liable for any botched, you know, raids on the wrong house. Uh, and, you know, it was a, it was a time, it showed that, you know, even in the, the height of Nixon's, you know, drug war and, and all of his, um, you know, kind of dehumanizing of, uh, drug offenders, that Congress was still capable of, some shame and of, uh, you know, being able to reflect and decide that maybe this particular policy had gone too far. Um, the no-knock raid would then, you know, then comes back in the 1980s with a vengeance. Uh, and we, you know, we've seen hundreds and hundreds of these no-knock raids on the wrong house and innocent people getting killed. And, you know, Congress hasn't given it a second thought since. So it was a kind of a little blip in history. I was actually really surprised when I found it in my research. I had no idea that uh, that, that had happened. Yeah, I mean, is this, I mean, ultimately, is this a story? Because we also have, I think, over that time as well, uh, over the past 30 years, the Supreme Court sort of loosening the restrictions on um, on the the requirements for, for protecting civil liberties, uh, particularly in terms of, well, in, in addition, I should say, in terms of, uh, of police work. I mean, so do we have... You know, because I think there is a natural tendency. I mean, going back uh, in another life, I was in a situation where I played a cop on the streets of New York, and I was wearing the uniform for a week on the streets of New York City, uh, basically without much oversight. And uh, I, I'll tell you what, it, 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 it certainly dramatically changed my attitude. I was, I found myself uh, jaywalking and stopping uh, cars and telling bike messengers to get off the street. I mean, I can only imagine yeah. when you uh, have that, I mean, I, I think back to that time and how, how radically it changed sort of my perspective on, on just what was happening around me and interviews that I did with police officers in the run-up to the uh, RNC in 2004 in New York City, and they were being told that this was going to be like Seattle times 10, and there were going to be uh, anarchists in here, with, and, uh, and they were really sort of worked up into a fervor of, of like, this is going to be a war, and we've got to get into these trenches. So on one hand, we have, I think, a culture that is susceptible to this type of thing, um, we have had uh, programs that have sort of played into that culture, but y you've cited examples of times where um, we've seen the federal government pull back on that. D what, what is the solution here to this? I mean, how do we redirect um, police departments around the country from being sort of uh, quasi-military or, or outfits to going back to a... Uh, a, a a more integrated sense of their role in the community. Well, uh, that's the million dollar question, I guess. Um, you know, I think there are, I mean, there are a number of, of of specific policies that we could repeal that would help. And one is, you know, these these giveaways of military equipment, the checks to buy more military equipment, uh, the incentives, the federal grants that go strictly toward drug policing, uh, and you know, let's go back to letting. Crime, be, crime policy be decided on a more local level without all of these influences and incentives. Um, you know, I think what you'd find is that police would de devote a lot more time to solving crimes with, you know, actual victims than, you know, crimes where every, every, all the parties consent, like a drug crime, for example. Um, but but, wait, but let me ask you this. A lot. In terms of, like, the locality, I mean, you've, you know, we have, uh, we, it seems to me that we have um, localities that could go one way or another. I mean, you, you huh? cite Wilson and his policing as being radically different than a guy like Gates, let's say. Um, yeah. Is it, it can't, well, could we also just say, you know what, instead of giving you these funds for uh, buying new gear, we're going to give you these funds to adding um, cops to your force. And so you can feel the security yeah. of having numbers on some level. It doesn't necessarily have to be in terms of firepower. Yeah, I, I mean, I think the problem with that with, with the federal grants, though, is that money is fungible. And, you know, you can give the par other department money to hire more cops, and then they can, you know, they can take whatever money they were going to use to hire cops 
uh, and move that to, you know, more aggressive policing. Um, you know, I, I, I do see your point about how, you know, I, th- I, you know I, I don't think we can completely leave policy up to the local level. I think, you know, I, I think we need a very robust uh, civil rights division within the Department of Justice. I mean, I think, I think, I think local police agencies should be able to dictate, you know, what laws are going to make a priority and, you know, what strat- policing strategies are going to use. Uh, that said, you know, they have to protect people's civil rights and civil liberties. And so I think, you know, I think the Department of Justice needs to do, and actually Obama's been a little better than Bush on this, although I, I still think it could be a lot better. I mean, I think that should be, I mean, that should be a priority of the Justice Department is making sure that police departments and actually and prosecutors for that matter are protecting, are, are observing uh, people's civil rights and civil liberties and, and not uh, abusing them. Um, but, you know, I mean, the, the, in terms of uh, specific uh, policies or, or even just kind of attitude changes. Uh, you know, I think, I think in general, I think the community aspects of policing need to be more emphasized and the, you know, kind of uh, kicking ass and taking names aspects need to be de-emphasized. Um, you know, talking about in the book, if you look at uh, police recruiting videos, the videos that they send out to high schools and colleges to, to get new cops, um, you know, the images are typically cops, you know, repelling out of helicopters and tackling people and kicking down doors and shooting at people. And, you know, that's the very first step in the process, right? You're, I mean, this is, uh, you are appealing to people who look at those images and think, that's what I want to do every day. Uh, and of course, you know, that's not what cops should be doing every day. Uh, you know, it's, it's, the, the aspects of policing are much more, uh, or that we want to emphasize are much more mundane. And so if you're, you know, if you go back to, think back to high school and think about people you went to high school with who, you know, would find a job uh, involving those activities appealing, uh, I think, you know, most of the time you would decide that that's one of the last people you want to become a police officer. Uh, so, you know, really de-emphasizing that stuff. But, you know, you talked about the, the power you felt when you were a cop uh, in New York. I mean... I was actually an know, actor is, playing a cop, but yeah, go ahead. Oh, when you're playing a cop. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's even a, a more powerful testament to this. I mean, you know, if you look at the Stanford prison experiments, for example, where, uh, you know, back in the 70s, uh, this professor, you know, got a random group of students and assigned one to be prison guards and the other to be prisoners, and they ended up having to uh, suspend the experiment after just a few days because the guards started abusing the prisoners, and actually, he played the role of the warden, and he found even himself, you know, taking a very antagonistic view toward the prisoners, and these were completely randomly assigned roles. Uh, if you look at the Milgram experience, uh, experiments, where you know, these volunteers were asked to administer electric, electric shocks to people, uh, and you know, they weren't actually shocks, but there were the actors on the other end were, you know, screaming in agony, uh, and the, the volunteers were told to keep giving the shocks, and they continued to give them. Uh, I mean, this, you know, this kind of stuff needs, should be taught at police academies. I mean, police officers need to be aware of what that kind of power can do to your psychology and, and the way that you view other people. Uh, and, you know, I think too often we, you know, we emphasize the, the threat that police officers face. We emphasize the... Uh, um, you know the dangers of the job, but we don't uh, we don't teach enough to police officers about what that kind of power can do to you emotionally and do to your psychology. Uh, so I mean that stuff needs to be taught at police academies, and I think it needs to be you know retaught uh, often. Uh, I a few months ago I had lunch with a guy who teaches uh, use of force classes to police agencies across the country. Uh, and he said one thing he's found in, in the last 10 or 15 years that he finds really disturbing is that uh, a lot of these courses, not, you know, not the ones he teaches, but that he's observed, they don't talk so much. Of, uh, there, there's very little emphasis on de-escalation now. There's very little emphasis on, you know, how to talk your way out, how to talk somebody down. Because, you know, a lot of these classes now focus on how to justify whatever force you've used right. after you've used it. Uh, so basically how to write a police report that, you know, exonerates you for whatever force you've just used. Uh, and that's really kind of telling. I mean, that, that we've gone, you know, that even the training has gone away from uh, preventing uh, police violence to finding ways to justify it after the fact. Uh, and so this is all, you know, this is all sort of cultural stuff that I think needs to be changed. And, and that's a very difficult thing to do. But you know, I think, it, again, it starts with policy and it starts with, uh, you know, electing public officials who understand these things and that, uh, you know, who are going to implement policies that, you know, emphasize the right aspects of police work. The, and, and, and this may be, I mean, I think, you know, this may be where, you know, sort of the, the ideological perspectives on which we, we approach this sort of diverge on some level because, 
you know, um, I mean, I, it seems to me counting on police departments around the, uh, the country on their own uh, with the hopes that in each of those police departments that we find in each locality are going to have this uh, level of of, I mean, maybe it's too uh, grandiose a word of saying enlightenment, seems to me far more far-fetched than simply saying on a uh, federal level, if we can incentivize people to buy more gear by giving them money and setting up a system of incentives to do this, I mean, you say that, uh, you know, that, uh, that federal funding is fungible, but that means that, that on the local level, <laughs> they're making the decision to to make it that fungible, uh, it seems to me there's got to be a mechanism coming out of Congress and uh, where we can have a, 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 a focal point of saying, uh, in, in a broader sense, that culturally speaking, we want a different culture of police work in this country, and then incentivizing and providing the funds to... Uh, to gear training towards that, to gear uh, uh, hiring and expenditures on a local level in that well, manner. I mean, obviously, uh, you're not going to have the feds run every police department, but if if the federal government can incentivize uh, through the drug war and through anti-terrorism policies too much sort of buffing up of these police departments, it seems they could also do the reverse, yeah? Well, in theory they could, but, I, I mean, if you look at uh, I mean, who in Congress is going to stand up and say we should give our police departments less money to fight the war on terror or to fight the war on drugs? I mean, you know, I, I point out in the book that you know, at the federal level, I mean, this has been a bipartisan rush to insanity. I mean, right. both parties right. are, are guilty of trying to outdo one another. I can tell you where there is actually some concern and action going on politically, it's at the state level. Uh, you know, Maryland is the first state in the country to pass a SWAT transparency bill to basically make all the police, police agencies that have a SWAT team in the state issue these reports with very detailed reports on how often they use their SWAT team and what purpose and whether shots were fired and uh, so forth. And we're seeing uh, there's a bill uh, in the Michigan legislature to do the same thing. And actually there's a bill in, uh, under, or a couple politicians in Utah that are going to introduce a bill that will go even farther than that and actually uh, attempt to put some restrictions on the use of these SWAT teams. Um, so I mean I think you know at the I think at the more local level people are more politicians are more accountable to uh, you know how people feel about their police departments. I think it, you know when you vote for your congressman you're voting for uh, you know I don't think you I don't think most of us vote for our con vote for a member of Congress thinking that that's going to affect how our police our local police officers you know behave or act or how they prioritize the laws. Uh, I think it's usually a, we consider that a much more local issue. Now, certainly Congress Clinton can, did know, pretty well, to, though, to, I mean, from a political well, standpoint, running for president on that community policing, whether or not it actually uh, was executed in the way that it was sold to us. But, I mean, from a political standpoint, I mean, I agree. Obviously, uh, you know, one doesn't necessarily have to operate to the exclusion of of the other. And, you know, and, but think and, about I mean, but think about the community policing thing was not, I mean, the reason why it was popular with even, you know, very far less progressive politicians is not because it was community policing. I'll give you a, an anecdote that illustrates this point. I, I actually uh, uh, participated in a forum on Capitol Hill that was sponsored by uh, Congressman Bobby Scott uh, shortly after the Democrats took over Congress in, uh, sometime in the mid-2000s. I can't remember the exact year. But So I gave my, you know, my spiel on police militarization. And um, you know, at the time, the Bush administration was actually trying to phase out the COPS program, uh, not you know, because they were cared about militarization, but just, you know, they were, they were trying to phase out a lot of programs. Uh, and, you know, I testified about, you know, to the, to, I talked about the, the militarization problem. And during the Q&A, uh, someone asked about the COPS program and asked if we should, you know, refund it because community policing is a great idea. Uh, and, you know, I said, you're right, it is a great idea. But I pointed out that because there were no restrictions on how these COPS grants were used, that, you know, these agencies across the country were using them to start SWAT teams. And Congressman Scott, the chairman of the crime subcommittee, said, you know, are you telling me that our community policing grants for, are being used to start SWAT teams? And I said, yes. And he said, you know, that's absurd. That's not what we intended at all. And we all had a good laugh about how ridiculous that was. Um, you know, six months later, uh, Scott presents his budget proposal to the leadership, which bakes it into the, basically the, the House Democrats' budget. 
And it refunded the GOPS program at 100% levels that it was during the Clinton administration with no restrictions at all on how the grants could be used by local police departments. So, you know, it's not as if they didn't know, uh, but, you know, when it comes right down to it, uh, Republican or Democrat, every politician likes to put out that press release saying, you know, I just secured $500,000 in federal money for our, our local heroes in blue. Uh, and if you're the one who stands up and says, you know, uh, but we, but I refuse to, you know, but there's no way I'm going to let them spend it on a SWAT team or I'm not going to let them, you know, use it to buy high, more high powered weapons. I mean, no congressman's going to do that. They love the, the adulation they get from, securing the grant and nobody wants to look, I mean, Republicans want to be the law and order party. You know, the Democrats are, uh, you know, in cahoots with the police unions. So there's really no political incentive for either of the two parties at a national level to, you know, to, to implement any of these reforms or to talk about how maybe things may have gone too far. Uh, just lastly, when you see uh, the announcement by uh, Holder yesterday regarding uh, mandatory um, uh, minimum sentencing for, for nonviolent drug users, I mean, and granted, we're not talking about a huge cohort of people. Uh, most, I think, uh, the vast majority of people who go to jail uh, under these offenses are are uh, uh, doing so under on state law as opposed to federal. But is this the type of thing that we need to see happen in terms of changing the culture that so that maybe we get to the point where a politician sees some value in saying we're sending this money uh, back to the district, but we're also going to make sure it's restricted in, in how it can be used? Well, I mean, I think to, to the extent that we are going to give these grants then yes, we need to put restrictions on how they're used and, and add stipulations to them. I mean, uh, one thing I talk about in the book is you can't really talk about whether police shootings, like officer, you know, police officers firing their guns at people, have gone up or down because even though there's a federal requirement that every police agency keep that data, it's just not enforced. Nobody, nobody's made the effort to actually enforce the requirement. Uh, and, you know, every police agency in the country gets federal money in some way or another, and there's, there's no reason why we can't say if you're going to take this money you have to be more accountable and transparent you have to give us let us know how you use your SWAT team you let us know how many times your police officers fire their guns and you know how many times they kill someone's pet um you know that should be yeah i agree i mean i i think we probably disagree on whether these federal funds should be going out at all but to the extent that they are yeah i think we should attach uh restrictions on how it's used to make sure that you know to the extent that we can they're used in the right way and that um you know, that, that they, if we can use them to keep apartments more transparent and accountability, accountable, uh, then that's a good thing. Are you encouraged by, um, by Holder's announcement? I mean, at least in terms of, if not for its immediate practical effects, but at least in terms of maybe this sort of 30-some-odd, 40-some-odd year now um, a drug war is starting yeah. to see some disintegration? Yeah, I mean, I I think I'm more encouraged by the symbolism than the practical effects. I mean, you know, the idea that, that the attorney general can get up and say some of the things that Holder said this week uh, is encouraging. Uh, the defense attorneys I've talked to say that there's not going to be a big actual practical effect in terms of, you know, reducing the, the uh, population of incarcerated people or even really reducing the way mandatory minimums are used uh, or changing, I guess, the way they're used. But, just to the extent that that can happen, that an attorney general could get up and say this and there wasn't an immediate you know, <laughs> political backlash uh, is encouraging. And, I, and I'll say this, I mean, I, I think even on the right, you're seeing a lot of movement toward, you know, reform and recognizing the problems of mass incarceration. Uh, you've got groups like Right on Crime, which, uh, you know, a lot of sort of marquee conservative names are finally starting to say, uh, you know, maybe we've gone too far and it's time to reconsider some of these things. So, I mean, I think the discussion is ripe for some change. Uh, unfortunately, you know, most of the people who are making noise at, at places like that are out of office, uh, where they can do so, you know, with uh, some political without with some political safety. But I think, you know, if there's a lesson uh, to your listeners who are concerned about this stuff, uh, I would say that, that that there has to be. I mean, politicians are not going to, uh, for the most part, voluntarily come out for reform and say that, you know. Our police have too much power. Um, they're only going to start to, to, you know, move for these changes if it becomes a political liability for them not to. Uh, so I'd say that, you know, even though political opinion polls 
you know, for example, on marijuana, uh, you know, a healthy majority of the country now supports legalizing marijuana, not not just medically, but outright. Uh, but you know, in Congress, I think it's like five, four or five percent, uh, and that's because there's you know there's still the sense that there's a lot of political risk in coming out to legalize pot, uh, and there's they don't really see any liability to just keeping quiet about it. Uh, so until people start you know voting on these issues and you know writing your congressman and saying you know why are you you shouldn't be using, you know, war terms when you're talking about policing or communities, you know, until they, they feel like there's actually some liability to them uh, propping up the status quo and, and keeping things the way they've been going. Uh, I think it's going to be difficult to persuade any politicians to change. And you know, politicians aren't known for their uh, uh, courage, uh, political courage for the most part. Right. And I think it's uh, sadly it's uh, it's only politicians that can really rein in uh, their police forces. Um, yeah, that's really where where the response. I mean, that's where it's going to where the change is going to come, and, and that's how we got here. I mean, I, I emphasize in the book that it's again, it's not an anti cop book. It's an if anything, it's an anti politician book. I mean, they're really the ones that set the policies that got us here. Radley Balco, uh, the book is Rise of the Warrior Cop. We'll put a link on uh, Majority FM. Thanks so much for your time today. 